Dr. Sewell, and uh, here we are for another installation of our ADRC lunch or brunch talk in which we don't provide lunch, which has been pointed out to me several times, unfortunately. Um, but we have a terrific talk for you today as people are trickling in. Um, but before we get going, I just wanted to introduce um, our ADRC director, Dr. Mary Sano, who will be introducing our speaker today. Dr. Sano. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, we're very excited to be able to do this next talk uh, for um, all of our audience. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Docky, Dr. Jackie Becker. Dr. Becker is a neuropsychologist in the Division of General Internal Medicine here at Mount Sinai. Um, and I think uh, she's got a very exciting topic for us today. Um, let me just tell you that she comes to us uh, having done her degree at uh, Fordham University and her residency at Harvard and um, at the Mass General. Um, but today she's going to give us an update on the um, cognitive dysfunction or cognitive impact that follows COVID-19 and sort of tell us where we go from here. So I'm going to turn this back over to Dr. Sewell, who will tell you about how our session will run. And then I really invite you to hear Dr. Becker's talk. I'm sure it's going to be very exciting. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sano. So just a note, you can see that we're recording this session, but nobody will be uh, seen, but we like to put it up on our ADRC website after these talks. So if people want to see it again, or they've had not been able to join us today, they can watch. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the talk via the chat. Down at the bottom of your screen, you see a little talking bubble that says chat. And if you click on that, you can type in your questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, before we take questions at the end, we'll have a couple of polling questions uh, for you and then and see what you have to say. So um, without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Becker, who will be sharing her slides with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sano and Dr. Sewell. Um, it's so nice to be here with you today. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Can everyone see this okay? Okay, great. Um, so, you know, thank you so much for having me here. It's it's so nice to be able to, to talk to everyone in the ADRC um, about some of the sort of exciting studies that and projects that we have going on here related to COVID, um, but also just to talk a little bit about some of the post-COVID effects such as cognitive impairment. Um, okay, here we go. Um, so before we get into you know, cognitive impairment that may arise from COVID, I wanna briefly touch on long COVID since it's sort of the umbrella term that post-COVID cognitive impairment falls under. Um, I'm sure you all have heard, seen, you know, tweeted, Instagrammed, read about long COVID from various sources. Um, and while of course there's a lot of false information out there, the reality is that there does seem to be a set of symptoms that can linger after individuals recover from COVID. And these symptoms together have been called long COVID in the media. Uh, it does go by many names. Officially it's called PASC or post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2. And those who have it are often called long haulers. So you may see articles that refer to these long haulers. Um, but whatever the name, you know, this, this syndrome is characterized by symptoms that prevent folks from sort of returning to their usual state of health, either physical or psychological or cognitive health for about at least two months after recovering from COVID. So what does long COVID look like? First of all, it can follow COVID of any severity. So even after mild or asymptomatic COVID as much as it does after severe COVID. Um, so, you know, it doesn't just happen to people who are hospitalized or, you know, in the intensive care unit, but it can happen to anyone who gets COVID. Um, but we don't know yet if it can happen for breakthrough infections actually, which is basically uh, when you get vaccinated and then you get COVID. Um, so far though, it does look like it's still possible to get long COVID if you get COVID after being vaccinated, but it's much more rare. It actually decreases your chance of long COVID apparently by about half. Um, and sort of the combination of symptoms can look very different for each person. 
It can be a mixture of any of these symptoms, such as extreme tiredness or fatigue, uh, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, chest pain or tightness, joint pain, changes to taste and smell that sort of you know, last beyond the acute period of COVID. And the reason why we're all here today, cognitive problems or what's some, sometimes called brain fog. Um, but before we get into post-COVID cognitive impairment or brain fog, uh, let's just quickly clear the air uh, about you know, what we mean when we say cognition. I'm sure you know everyone here hears about this all the time and talks about this all the time. But you know, of course, cognition refers to the set of mental abilities and processes that we need to basically carry out any task from simple to complex. And there are several different processes that help us carry out tasks. Um, we typically organize these into domains. So that includes, for example, attention, how quickly we process information, language, visual and spatial abilities, memory, and something that we call executive functioning. Uh, and these, are, these, of course, are the same domains that we think about in normal aging or dementia. It's not exclusive to sort of the brain fog and COVID. Um, is everyone here familiar with the term executive functioning? Um, well, it, either case. Maybe, yeah, Jackie, yeah. go ahead and explain that. I'll explain it. it it's, a, it's, it's a little complex, but I like to think of executive functions as being similar to sort of like the CEO of the brain. So it sort of, you know, oversees and monitors all the different departments or domains of the brain um, so that the brain can achieve goals as efficiently and effectively as possible. And so executive functions basically enable us to plan, problem solve, reason, make decisions, organize, uh, multitask, control our impulses, among other things. So they're sort of in charge of many of our higher order abilities. Um, so now that we have an understanding about cognition, uh, let's talk about what brain fog really means. Um, so brain fog refers to problems with thinking, memory, and concentration, but actually most studies have found that people have trouble mainly with executive functioning. Um, and so it, the difficulties with executive function can then impact other domains um, or other, other areas. So for example, you know, if you're unable to organize the grocery list and you have, let's say, you know, chicken, broccoli, soda, apple, meat, it's a lot harder to remember them. So it impacts your memory versus if you had chicken, meat, broccoli, and then soda, you might be able to remember it a little bit better. So that's just an example of how executive functioning can impact some of those other domains. Um, the exact symptoms, though, can be challenging for a lot, of a lot of people to describe. Some people will just say that they just don't feel right, or you know, the term fog is because patients feel sometimes like something is over them that is making things just not as crisp, or they just feel different than they were before, but they can't quite explain it. Um, and this may fluctuate. So people tend to say they have good days and bad days. Um, and unfortunately in our research so far, we don't quite know what places people at greater risk for having brain fog. It doesn't appear to be linked to how severe COVID was and both young and older adults appear to get it. So the same risk factors for getting cognitive impairment of other causes don't seem to apply here. Um, and we also don't know what percentage of people who recover from COVID actually get it. Uh, studies seem to range from about 20 to 80%, which is a huge range of course. And this is in large part due to differences in how these studies evaluated cognition and also the types of participants that were enrolled in these studies. So what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of studies will look at patients right after their discharge from the hospital and report that as, you know, the prevalence of cognitive impairment. But that doesn't really tell the whole story. Um, and so it's really important for studies to look at patients you know, after they've recovered from COVID and also across the spectrum of disease severity. And that's actually something that we did in a study here at Sinai as part of the Mount Sinai post-COVID registry. Uh, so we found that about 24% of people who recovered from COVID had cognitive impairment. And this was about seven and a half months post-COVID. Um, so the age, the 
age of the participants was pretty young. The average age was about 49. Um, and this was about seven and a half months post COVID. So, you know, patients had recovered um, after, after a while and still had some cognitive impairment. Um, and if you take a look at this graph here, so the, the purple bars show patients who were hospitalized for COVID, while the pink bars are people who were treated in the emergency room, and then the blue are people who had COVID and stayed home to recover, um, which to us suggests it was likely mild COVID. So we think of you know, the sort of sites of care as a proxy for how severe the COVID was. So mild, moderate, and severe COVID. Um, and what this graph shows us here is that a greater percentage of people who were hospitalized for COVID had cognitive impairment when comparing them to those with more mild COVID. Um, and overall, we found that cognitive impairment spanned multiple domains. So we found that speed of processing information was a little slower. Um, they had trouble with executive functioning, with verbal fluency, and with learning and memory. And you know, this was about 740 participants in the post-COVID registry. And, and to me, you know, what's really striking here again is that this is so long after having had COVID and that, you know, again, the fairly young age range of these patients um, was quite surprising. So just to give you a sense of what brain fog can look like, um, here's an email that I received from someone who saw our study and reached out thinking that he may have brain fog. He said, I'm a 44 year old man, usually healthy. I'm a software developer in my occupation and recently was kicked off a job due to my degraded performance. My story starts something like nine to 10 months ago when I got sick by COVID, I stayed home but was able to still work during the sickness, very similar to the flu I experienced in the past. After I recovered, my life was not the same any longer in terms of how well I was. My brain was like in the cloud, like always in some kind of denial. My thoughts were and are clouded and I cannot change it in any way. I could not focus enough to even solve some of the simplest of the tasks sometimes, and it effectively changed my own ability to deal with missions and tasks at work. I was working with complex and sometimes less complex code parts at work, and it is impossible to deal with it now. Deep in my heart, I know and feel what happened to me. Please advise me if there is any way I can recover and get my mind back. So as you can see, this was a relatively young man, you know, 44 years old, who appears to have had fairly mild COVID and was previously healthy, and still is struggling quite a bit um, with some of these residual difficulties, even nine or 10 months after his COVID diagnosis. And really, you know, we, we've, we've heard this story quite a few times of, you know, people who are otherwise young and healthy and doing okay, and then, you know, had COVID and don't quite feel the same anymore. So some of you may be wondering, how is this type of cognitive impairment different from other types of cognitive impairment? Well, first of all, as far as we know, COVID-related brain fog is not neurodegenerative, meaning that we don't expect it will get worse over time. We also know that the pathology, so the underlying mechanisms behind what causes it, are likely different from those of neurodegener neurodegenerative disorders. All of that said, though, we still don't know if COVID can accelerate or exacerbate pre-existing neurodegenerative disorders and make them worse or other kinds of cognitive decline. As far as the symptoms themselves, though, they may not actually be that different for many people. So in fact, some of the most co the common issues that patients with brain fog report are probably even not that foreign to many of us who don't have cognitive impairment. Uh, so for example, losing their train of thought, difficulty thinking of the right words, difficulty remembering what they just read, taking longer to complete tasks, forgetting recipes or steps when cooking, leaving lights or appliances on unintentionally, trouble multitasking, right? These are things that, I mean, I'm even guilty of having them sometimes. And I think, you know, they're pretty common problems that we may feel day to day. Um, but for people with brain fog, these can be very impairing. And, you know, usually we're able to differentiate it by looking at, you know, first when these difficulties started. So the onset, which in this case would be right after recovering from COVID. So not long standing. Um, we then look at severity or the degree of difficulty that the patient may have. So how bad are these problems for, for these people? And then we look at frequency. So how often they have trouble with these things. 
Is it every once in a while, like I mentioned, or, or is it every day? Uh, people with brain fog often report having a significant change in their cognitive functioning from where they were right before COVID. So COVID happened and then they got worse. And they report that these problems happen most of the day, nearly every day. And they, they tend to interfere for, uh, for many of these people, they tend to interfere and make it difficult for them to sort of carry out their usual tasks, like their, their jobs or caring for loved ones, for example. So another question I get asked frequently is, how long does this post-COVID brain fog last? So far, research has shown us that some people may completely return to normal in about three months or so. Um, but for others, it can last much longer, especially if they were hospitalized or treated in the intensive care unit. In our study, as I mentioned, we saw that the symptoms still lingered you know, even almost eight months after COVID. Um, some people also report that they have seen some improvement in symptoms, but they're still not back to normal. So, you know, again, some days people may say they feel great, and then two or three days later, they may not feel so great. And so, as you can imagine, this can impact functioning in very different ways for very different people. Um, some may not function well, while others may say it's just a little bit harder and more effortful to, you know, sort of stay engaged in conversations or, or work for long periods of time. Um, but in general, you know, when it comes to cognitive recovery, it usually isn't a straight course and building up cognitive skills again can take time. And this is the case for cognitive impairment that results from most types of brain injuries. So not just after COVID. So speaking of brain injury, let's talk about how COVID affects the brain. A lot of people wonder how an illness that was first described as sort of a, a respiratory illness that targeted the lungs can affect a completely different organ like the brain. And well, the answer is that we now know that COVID is actually a systemic disease, right? So this means that it can affect all organs, including the brain. But we're still researching potential causes of brain fog after COVID. And it, it's likely that there are many factors that contribute to what's going on. Um, though so far we, we do have a few guesses. So for people who did have breathing problems from COVID, it's possible that, you know, this didn't really allow enough oxygen to reach the brain. Um, this is something we call hypoxia and can also cause damage to brain tissue. Um, there were other complications also reported for those with severe COVID who were hospitalized or treated in the intensive care unit, like strokes, for example. Um, and these can also result in cognitive problems as well. There are also a multitude of sort of hospital related factors and treatments like being intubated and, and different kinds of steroid medications and things like that, that people may have been given while they were hospitalized that you know, we know contributes to cognitive impairment. But for those without severe COVID, we think it could be a combination of other factors like inflammation. What I mean by that is you know, the body's immune response to COVID can trigger a sort of reaction that causes inflammation throughout the body. And this can potentially damage brain tissue. We know from other diseases that cause cognitive impairment that inflammation can often play a key role. So it's very likely that this is what we're seeing here, but of course, inflammation is very different uh, for different disease processes. Um, another possibility is that you know, and this one's a little bit more controversial, uh, is that SARS-CoV-2, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus may directly invade brain cells. So, you know, many scientists actually believe that the virus can enter through our nose and then spread to, you know, the brain and impact brain tissue in that way. Um, and in fact, the loss of smell that some people with COVID experience might indicate that either directly or indirectly, COVID is affecting the brain areas responsible for sense of smell. But again, this hypothesis is a bit more controversial, and that's particularly because the only way to really study this is through autopsy studies, which obviously means, you know, they're looking at brains of people who didn't survive. So it's a bit biased in that way. Um, so we just don't know for sure if this is a actually a possibility for people who, you know, do okay after COVID, um, which is actually the majority of the population. So. Another thing I wanna bring up that is very important is that other factors can, can often mimic or look like brain fog or you know, even exacerbate or make brain fog worse. And, and these factors are critical because 
first of all, we know that they impact cognitive functioning even in people without COVID. And second, it's important to figure this out because sometimes if you fix one of these factors, the cognitive impairment can get better. Um, so first, psychological problems like depression, anxiety, or even you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, um, either as a result of having COVID or just from living through the difficult times of the pandemic, um, these things can certainly affect our cognitive functioning. Um, I do get asked all the time, so I want to touch on this, how, how depression or you know, even anxiety can impact our cognition. And so the example I usually give is, you know, say that you're walking home and as you approach the door, you sort of start looking for your keys in your bag. And then you, you know, notice that there's like a dark, scary figure in the bushes and you sort of become really anxious. Um, so will that help you find your keys faster or slower? Probably slower, right? Um, that's because anxiety, like depression, can sort of consume our attentional resources and sort of disrupt our brain's normal thinking processes. Um, I hope that all makes sense. I can't see anyone for questions, so I'll just go on. Um, okay, so... Actually, Dr. Becker, let me just stop you for one second on that last slide. So, sure. you know, one question we just had in the chat is, um, did did you look at the relationship between um, fatigue and the cognitive symptoms? And did you find you know, that a relationship between those two variables? That's a great question. I'm gonna talk about fatigue in a little bit, um, but we did look at fatigue and actually we did not see that, that it accounted for what we were seeing, but that's a great question. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. The other question about this slide is, these things that you say, what else can contribute? Are you saying that people who have some of these situations before COVID would lead it to be more likely they would get cognitive symptoms following COVID, that they would be worse if they got them after COVID or are they just factors that can cause cognitive difficulties? These are factors that we like to look at because we feel like sometimes when people say that they have brain fog, there may be other things that, you know, just by virtue of being in the pandemic. So for example, having anxiety or depression from being socially isolated or, you know, whatever. So people might identify that they've had cognitive impairment after COVID, but maybe it's because of some of these factors and not because their brain has actually been impacted in the ways that I was talking about with inflammation, for example. And right. so this basically is, you know, the difference between people infected by SARS-CoV-2 and the people who were affected by the pandemic. Does that make sense? It, yeah, it does. So, someone just also chatted, what kinds of medications um, might contribute? Yeah, so, so there are a couple of different kinds of medications. We know that things like, um, so medications with anticholinergic properties, so that would be like laxatives, muscle relaxants, there are definitely some um, uh, antihypertensives, um, you know, I can pull up a list after this talk for the Q&A, but I actually have a, a little list of different medications that can impact co cognition. Um, and certainly there are some, you know, I think tricyclic, so there are, there are antidepressants or anticonvulsants that can you know suppress cognition? So if, if if anyone ever starts a new medication or increases the dose and then starts feeling cognitive impairment, you know then it's certainly important to check in with with their doctor about that. Um, and again, I can I can sort of pull pull up the list at the end of the talk if, for those of you who are interested. Um, and I should also so I should mention the rest of the list here too, which is you know hormone changes, um, like meta menopause, for example, or thyroid problems. Um, sometimes after COVID, there have been some people who reported thyroid issues after recovering from the illness as well. So that could be contributing. Um, you know, I think from the pandemic, not, not exercising or not being social for a while because of having to quarantine, um, these things can actually impact our cognition as well, um, or in, in the sense that it makes us feel a little bit more foggy, you know, not, not being social for a while and not going outside, not exercising. 
Um, and studies have shown also that you know, both exercise and social activity can actually be protective factors for um, later cognitive decline. So, um, you know, it is important to keep those up uh, even during the pandemic. Um, and another big reason for brain fog might be not getting enough or not getting restful sleep. So again, as someone was asking about fatigue, you know, tiredness has sort of a, a way of making everything in the brain process more slowly. Um, and can disrupt cognitive processes. And so, again, this is the case whether or not you've had COVID, um, and I'll, I'll touch on this a bit some more, um, but you know, fatigue certainly can, can make you feel a little bit foggy. And, and I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention this, but of course, normal aging can cause one to feel less sharp at times. So that's important to keep in mind. And I'll also talk about that in a moment. And finally, it's possible that there's something else going on entirely that has nothing to do with COVID, or maybe something was going on and COVID made it worse. Um, so here, okay, so here I'm going to touch on what I was saying about normal aging. Um, so most of you already know this um, and have experienced this, but I think it's worth saying that as we age, it's normal to see changes in our cognitive abilities. Um, so, for example, our crystallized abilities, which involve knowledge that comes from past learning and experiences, like our vocabulary, for example, can actually improve with every decade of life. So, actually, it's, it's interesting how I, I, I have some people say, like, you know, I'm getting better and better at these crossword puzzles every year. I must be really sharp. And, and this is sort of why. Um, you know, a lot of people who finally complete the New York Times crossword puzzle um, happen to be in the last few decades of life. So conversely, our fluid abilities, which are things like our memory, the speed at which we process information, our ability to problem solve and reason, um, these actually depressingly peak during our 30s and then decline to a degree over the years. Um, for those who know, know about these scores, it's actually about 0 0.02 standard deviations per year. So um, that's sort of the, the average rate. Um, and some people notice this decline, while others don't, because it's fairly subtle and we learn to compensate for them. Uh, but either way, it's totally normal to experience these changes, even though it does worry a lot of people. Uh, that said, when people start to notice that these changes are impacting the way they function, such as you know being able to work, cook, uh, take public transportation by themselves, uh, et cetera, then, you know, it is possible that something else is going on and, and they may need an evaluation. Um, which brings me to another question that I get asked a lot, uh, which is, can COVID make existing cognitive problems worse? So this is a difficult one to answer because we need a lot more research in this area. Um, so far, researchers have found, though, that some genes are responsible for increasing the risk of severe COVID and are also linked to a higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. So we do, we do have some evidence of that so far. Um, we also have some neuroimaging studies where they take brain scans before and after COVID. And this also suggested that COVID may cause actual brain changes similar to those that we see in people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, but, you know, other similar studies have not found these same brain changes. So, you know, really the, the jury is still out there and, and, you know, we need a little bit more targeted studies with, with less bias. Um, researchers have also found inflammation, as I mentioned before, to be a common theme across many brain disorders and dementias. And, you know, post-COVID brain fog um, as well, but not all inflammation is the same. And then, you know, as many of you know, de dementia can take years to progress. So, you know, our research will really just need to follow people over time and see if brain fog gets worse over time. Um, what we do know is that brain fog is not the same as dementia, particularly because for many folks, it can resolve over time. Um, as of now, we just don't, don't know and don't have enough evidence to say whether or not COVID can you know, make mild and cognitive impairment worse or increase the risk for dementia. Um, but, you know, we do know factors that can place people at greater risk for cognitive decline in general. Um, so, so I included some of those here. 
Um, while again, we don't know if they are risk factors for post-COVID brain fog, I think they're important to keep in mind uh, because you know, they are very much related to overall brain health and are also potentially what we call modifiable, meaning that they are things that we can change or treat. Um, so the first few are, you know, mainly cardiovascular risk factors. So, you know, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, I'll include diabetes in there. These are, these are sort of factors that, you know, when they are poorly controlled, meaning that, you know, you're not taking medications for them properly, or you're not following up with your doctor about improving them, um, they can impact your brain health. So uh, obesity and smoking are other factors that imp impact brain health. So of course, working to exercise, eating healthy, and to you know, quit smoking, these things can potentially mitigate the risk. And then sleep apnea, uh, back to that fatigue talk, um, is something that people are often surprised about, but it does play into you know, people not getting restful sleep and feeling constantly tired um, and also potentially depriving your brain of oxygen um, oh, cr chronically in low doses over time. Um, so when patients tell me that they snore and they never, never feel rested, I usually recommend a sleep study to see if sleep apnea might be the culprit. And, you know, more often than not, as soon as they, you know, are diagnosed and start with a CPAP machine, it can be enormously helpful for, for people and, and they start to feel sharper. So here we go on our fatigue talk, um, speaking of sleep. Uh, so, you know, fatigue is actually one of the most common and persistent symptoms that people experience after COVID. Um, and when it doesn't go away, it can impact our ability to function. Um, first and foremost, it can get in the way of our cognition and cloud our memory and concentration as we've been talking about. Um, and also, you know, as I'm sure everyone here has experienced when we're tired, you know, our, our fuse, fuse tends to be shorter and we may be more irritable, frustrated, anxious, maybe even depressed or have other emotional issues. Um, being tired can also make us more sensitive to light and sounds or can make you feel sort of achy and unwell. And so then as a result, you may want to stay home, not go to work, not be social with others. You may also not want to exercise or go for a walk, right? So as you can see, fatigue can impact cognition and the way that we function in our daily lives, um, whether it's after COVID or not COVID related. Um, but so it's not really surprising that tiredness is a big factor to have in the back of your mind if, you know, you feel like you may have cognitive problems from COVID or other causes. Um, and, you know, it, it is very common after having COVID. It's something called post-viral fatigue. Um, and sometimes that's the only long COVID symptom that people really experience. Um, and again, they, they feel like maybe they have brain fog, but when the fatigue gets better, so does the brain fog. So, um, you know, I do want to stress, though, that while it's normal for us to feel tired sometimes, especially after recovering from an illness, extreme tiredness most of the time is not normal. Um, and so, again, fatigue is considered a long COVID symptom that may take time to resolve, but it's important to check in with your doctor um, about it if you have anyone, um, if you or anyone that you know is, is sort of feeling this extreme tiredness. Any follow-up questions to fatigue that I didn't answer? I'll just move on. All right, so what should you do if someone you know, if you or someone you know is experiencing brain fog or other cognitive problems? Um, so the first would be to check with your doctor to rule out the other causes we've talked about. Um, again, these fact, there are a lot of these factors that can be treatable, so this is very important. Um, the second thing I recommend is that people incorporate compensatory strategies like using a calendar or taking notes to help with memory, um, using word associations to help you find words for things and, and to remember names, um, minimizing distractions, which means, you know, less multitasks, less multitasking and sort of tackling one task at a time, um, putting phones away or turning off the TV during conversations or when you're trying to concentrate on a task. Um, I see people doing this all the time where they're just, you know, looking at their phone in the middle of a conversation and then they say like, oh, I, you know, 
I missed completely what this person said to me. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, put the phone away and that can help sometimes. Um, so, you know, over time as people recover though, the hope is that they will need to rely on these strategies less and less and, and hopefully eventually go back to normal ways of doing things. Um, if I haven't said it enough during this lecture, I'll say it again, getting a good night's sleep is of course hugely important. Um, increasing physical activity also can have a lot of, you know, beneficial effects. It oxygenates and clears toxins from the body. Um, a huge caveat though that I will add here is that post COVID, a lot of people experience a condition called post exertional malaise. So this basically just means people feel really unwell after exerting themselves in any way. So sometimes it's just walking down the hall. Sometimes it's, you know, walking upstairs. So people can just suddenly feel anxious, unwell, tired. Um, so of course it's important to, you know, talk to your doctor if you feel this um, and you know, get cleared before starting to exercise again. Um, <clears throat> And so I, I also get asked about brain games a lot. Um, again, not just post COVID, but in general, or you know, like Sudoku or doing crossword puzzles. Um, and people want to know if it can be helpful. And I just want to touch on this because you know what we know from the literature is that it's it's always great to keep your brain active. That's for sure. Um, but the research just doesn't quite pan out that doing these brain games will have any sort of lasting effects on cognitive functioning or strengthen any of the cognitive skills um, or even prevent cognitive decline, I should say. Um, some studies do show that some games can, you know, help a, a little and others show that it re they really make no difference. Um, but really, you know, practicing a game over and over again makes you good at that game is what we're finding. And it doesn't necessarily translate into, you know, real world games. Um, and so, you know, most games, again, are, they may not fully sort of activate your brain um, and just tend to be a little bit repetitive after a while. Uh, that said, though, it certainly doesn't hurt, but I would stay away from, you know, some of these like software claims that are very expensive and claim to improve cognition. Um, and finally, I get asked about cognitive rehabilitation frequently. Um, we know from other brain injuries that cognitive rehabilitation can be helpful. Um, it sort of cognitive rehabilitation, for those of you who don't know, refers to a, a group of therapies that sort of aim to teach compensatory strategies for people with cognitive impairment to sort of help them better manage their lives. And in some cases, like after acquired brain injuries or strokes, it can lead to improvement in some cognitive skills. But in the case of you know, post COVID brain fog, um, it's really just meant to help individuals learn to how to carry, carry on with their difficulties and compensate for their, their difficulties so that they can get back to functioning. Um, and in this way, you know, the experts that do cognitive rehabilitation can sort of customize plans for brain fitness that help with recovery. Um, and it's important to know, I think, too, that, you know, insurance plans really vary in their coverage for, for rehab, for, for brain fog in particular, and for other issues as well. Um, that said, the, the ADA actually now considers long COVID a disability, which includes brain fog. So this does help the case for insurance reimbursement, but, you know, check with your plan because every plan is different. Um, and when patients are experiencing, you know, significant difficulty functioning, a cog rehab, again, can be worth considering, but it's not something that I think most people with, you know, sort of very mild brain fog would necessarily need to spend time and money on. Um, we, we don't know yet if it would be helpful for, for those folks, and it's, all, it's always possible that the mild brain fog will sort of resolve on its own over time. Um, but again, something to check in with, with doctors about. Um, so, you know, just to quickly summarize what we talked about here today, I think, you know, brain fog is, is one of the many possible symptoms that can result after having COVID and again, can happen in adults of all ages and after mild, moderate or severe COVID and can sometimes linger for a while. Um, for some, it can impact functioning to a degree, while for others, it's just kind of a nuisance and things are more effortful for a little while. We don't know how long it lasts for. Um, it's likely to be different for everyone, but 
you know, we expect that most people will recover over time. We just don't know yet how much time. Um, it sometimes is a, a bit hard to differentiate brain fog from other types of cognitive impairment. So it's always a good idea to try to rule out other causes and sort of, you know, treat underlying issues like depression and fatigue, as I mentioned, um, because it's possible that for, for some people, the impairment is reversible. Um, it's also important to, you know, maintain brain health with a healthy diet, exercise, reducing those risk factors we talked about, like high cholesterol and high blood pressure, and just manage those, you know, those and any other chronic conditions. Um, so all in all, um, if you or someone you know is experiencing brain fog, um, or even if you're not sure if it's brain fog or not, it's always better to get checked out um, rather than waiting. Um, and of course, in general, the more you can do to protect yourself against COVID, the better. Um, so with that, I'll open to some questions. And I've included here the link to the um, Mount Sinai Center for Post-COVID Care um, in case anyone is interested. And um, if you are being treated at Mount Sinai at all, you are eligible to be in the Mount Sinai COVID Registry to help with research. So you are welcome to you know, touch base with uh, the Mount Sinai Center for Post-COVID Care about that as well, if, if you'd like to participate. So thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Becker. Um, and we're gonna take some questions in just a second, but before we do, in case people can't stay for the questions, I know that Dr. Luizos is going to put up a question or two for polling. So you'll see this question pop up on your screens. Um, and if you can just uh, click. So Dr. Lisa's, well, oh, they'll see both questions. Yep, so you'll just have to scroll down to the second one. Okay. It seems that people are responding to both. <laughs> In other words, everyone but me figured that out already. That's okay. <laughs> uh, so while people are answering, let me let me start with a question, Dr. Becker. I the study that's going on now, the seven hundred plus people in the registry. Are you saying that people who are being treated at Mount Sinai on this call for anything would be eligible to join the study? Like, what are the what's the criteria for joining it? Yeah, so the criteria for the registry is actually, um, you don't even have to have had COVID because we do have uh, COVID controls in the study as well, or non-infected controls rather. Um, the only criteria is to either speak English or Spanish and be over the age of 18 and be treated within the Mount Sinai health system for any reason. Any reason uh, at all. For any reason. And then you can be enrolled into the Mount Sinai COVID registry. And we actually have about 1400 participants so far. Oh, wow. uh, so the, the 740 that we reported in our study was was from a while ago. Right. Um, so so we'll growing. be following up hopefully with our, our new results um, shortly. And yeah, that and that was my my second related question, which is, um, are you it's, I'm struck by the fact that, of course, this is all very new. COVID is only a couple of years old and there's so much that we don't know yet because we simply don't have the data. And how long are you planning to follow this group of people to maybe answer some more of these questions? So we are planning to follow this cohort for about the next four years, and we're hoping to enroll another 600 participants. So we're hoping for about 2,000, um, and again, following them over time. And, and you know, this, this cohort actually doesn't just involve uh, cognitive measures, but we're also doing you know, blood work to look at inflammatory markers and other kinds of um, important markers for, uh, you know, disease progression. So, you know, it involves lots of different kinds of questionnaires. We look at fatigue, we look at depression, anxiety, um, lots of different uh, sort of psychosocial issues. And so it's a pretty comprehensive uh you know, package, I guess, that, that we right. give patients. Um, so I have a related question, which I think pertains to a lot of people who watch the talk today is, are there, are there people in this study who you know have some kind of cognitive impairment going into this before COVID, people who might have MCI or some other cognitive issue? That, that, I, that I know of, you said, or that? Yeah, um, are, are those people being excluded from this study or would they be included or? would be they would be included so long as it's so long as they haven't been diagnosed with dementia um but they are being excluded from the analyses for the cognitive portion 
So they are included for you know, other studies that we have that are related to the COVID registry that have nothing to do with cognitive functioning. <laughs> Um, but, but people with, with, uh, diagnosed dementia are unfortunately excluded. Yeah. Cause I guess one question many of us in this, uh, talk would have is that, are you, if you do have MCI or, or dementia, whether it's vascular or Alzheimer's or some other reason, is this going to make you more likely to suffer additional cognitive impact? Um, if you do get COVID? And I guess the yeah. short answer is we don't know yet. We don't know. And it, it's unfortunate because a lot of these people are actually excluded from cognitive studies for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, but we do know, we, ha we do have some case reports um, of people with MCI, with mild cognitive impairment, that then got COVID and got worse. Um, and, you know, anecdotally, I, I have received sort of you know, emails again after the study came out that people sort of said like, you know, oh, my father seemingly developed dementia overnight, you know, and it's really bad. And, you know, it, it's likely that there was something else going on before and this exacerbated it. So, you know, again, this is purely anecdotal because we just don't have the research for that yet. Um, but I, I can imagine how, you know, having any kind of illness, uh, not just COVID, but having any kind of severe illness when you have, you know, cognitive impairment or other kinds of cognitive frailties that it, it would exacerbate it and make it worse. Well, I think too, many of us on this call who, who um, evaluate people who have cognitive concerns, whether for one of our studies or clinically, have been struck that nearly everyone, whether they have any real memory problem or not, has talked about the impact of isolation mm -hmm. over the last two years of older people on cognition. And I, I mean, multiple times a week, I hear, well, you know, my mother or grandmother was sort of okay before the pandemic, but then she spent most of the last two years pretty much alone and she's like a different person. And um, I think this research is fascinating because if you get to follow them over time, hopefully, you can begin to tease out some of those uh, factors that can impact, you know, what actually is causing that brain fog. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's so important for us to have these control participants as well, because, yeah. you know, being able to see people who are, again, infected by SARS-CoV-2 versus those who are affected by just being in the pandemic. And, and you know, the social isolation, certainly for older adults, I think, is, is especially problematic, um, you know, because, so, you know, social activity and social stimulation is considered a protective factor for later cognitive decline. And so, so social isolation can certainly, you know, impact cognition. Um, but, but I think for all of us, right, I think, I think our lives have changed since, you know, March of 2020, it's pretty significantly for everybody. There, uh, there are a lot of psychological and other emotional issues also that that play into that and feelings not just social isolation but loneliness and and depression and and anxiety about about getting sick um, all of those things can can impact our, our brain health and, and our cognition so well hopefully it will be like the the research about people who have chemotherapy when they're being treated mm -hmm. for cancer and they get they call it you know the chemo brain the brain, brain yeah fog, right which is a similar kind of experience of brain fog and uh, you know the vast majority of those people do recover within a year so hopefully yeah maybe. so yeah, well, thank you um, over time <laughs> so much dr becker i did really um i think that was yeah everyone is just saying thank you great presentation in our chat now i think we got to everyone's questions and um i want to thank you so much it's such a um interesting area of research and hopefully you can come back in a year and tell us yeah and we'll give you an update <laughs> <laughs> all right well thanks so much we appreciate yeah. it thanks good to see everybody and uh, talk to you soon everyone <laughs>